When I first started studying neurolinguistic programming, I found this a very useful reference as an overview. When we experience an external event, we do th so by seeing it, hearing it, touching it, smelling it, or tasting it. And we have unconscious and conscious filters for that sensory input. So we have to delete a lot of information and just focus in on what is important to us. And we learned to do this because we had to focus in on what was important to our survival. We also have to make decisions as to what's dangerous and what isn't dangerous, what works and what doesn't work, um, and just basic learning. I now pretty much know how to work a door. If there's a rectangle in the wall and there's a handle on it, it doesn't have to be a door I've seen before for me now to know how to open it. It's a generalized rule that I've got from my experience of doors in the past. And of course we distort things. Um, we think we see someone glance up and no, it's not the same person, it's just someone who looks a little bit like them. Or maybe looking up at the clouds we end up seeing a face. We're genetically predisposed to recognize faces because it's the first thing we saw when we looked up at our, um, at our mother's face. So we're taking this filtered information through our senses and creating internal representations of it. Our mind is creating pictures. We're using part of the brain that um, is associated with the eyes to create pictures. We use the same part of the brain to remember pictures. And sounds, and not so much tastes and smells, but definitely feelings. If we get a thought and a picture comes up, we get an associated feeling. And that will have an effect on our neurophysiological state. And our physiology has an effect on that state as well. If you hold yourself in a really tense way, you will end up feeling slightly anxious. But our state will affect our behavior. If I'm in a fearful state, I behave in a very, very different way than when I'm feeling in a loving, happy state. Now, as I started digging deeper into this, the models began to get more compli complicated. And one of the best that I've found for uh, explaining it for me was created, I believe, by Trevor Sylvester, who wrote a book called Word Weaving, The Science of Suggestion. I think Word Weaving 2 was the question is the answer. But in the first Word Weaving book, he came up with the, uh, the uh, model which he named the Memory Matrix Model. It started off very similar to the last slide with stimulus from our senses. Now, as soon as we get some kind of stimulus from our senses, as long as we're not a newborn baby, we'll have some memories to go back to. We'll have a matrix of memories of pictures and feelings and sounds that we've stored in our head, and we make comparisons about what's happening in our environment and how does that relate to what's happened before. Now, if it's scary or if it's some way arousing, we experience an emotion, a change in our body chemistry will come with many of the thoughts. If we get frightened, then we, we instantly know what, our body knows what to do. We don't even have to consciously think about it. There will be chemical changes in our body. And so we will actually respond in a particular way once we've had that emotion. As long as we get that stimulus, that response will continue. And eventually, once the stimulus goes, we can terminate that response and begin the process of evaluation. Now, I remember once I was um, in the Hollywood Hills, a few, few days after I'd seen quite a large snake in South uh, Los Angeles, and I was walking through uh, a bushed area, trying to get a, a, a view out over all the lovely houses with all the swimming pools, and all of a sudden I leapt straight into my friend, because I'd seen something out of the corner of my eye. The stimulus I saw was something, it looked vaguely like a snake to me. So I just leapt into him, because my... I unconsciously matched up that image out of the corner of my eye with an image of a snake. So I had the emotion of fear. Conscious awareness comes when you when you notice the the, uh, the chemical changes in your body. But I didn't even think about it. My response was just to jump out of the way. I then, once I realised it was only a stick, I stopped running, terminated my behaviour, and began to evaluate it. Well, I wasn't particularly happy because my friends were now laughing at me. So I went back into my, I went through that process again about a time when I'd been laughed at at primary school. 
and I had the emotion of um, of anxiety a bit, and I sort of sulked a little bit. I was a bit non-responsive, but after a while, I stopped thinking about it. I terminated that behaviour, and I just evaluated. It, oh well, it was one of those things. You know, in the great scheme of things, it doesn't matter. So I've gone from a stimulus to pulling up a memory, to having an emotion, and becoming consciously aware of that to a degree. Now, sometimes the response can butterfly out in, to affect other situations. A friend of mine, just after they passed their driving test, they went on a journey and were unable to park. They couldn't find anywhere to park, and every time they did find somewhere that they thought they should be able to park in, they couldn't, and they began to get hot and bothered, really, really stressed out. Um, so now every time they get into a car, they think, or even before they get into a car, they think about that particular memory and how anxious they were. So that memory and emotion comes in as, to be a stimulus for them to get anxious. Got to the point where their response was, don't like driving. In fact, I'm not a good driver. In fact, I don't drive. No, I used to drive, didn't like it. Um, oh, the driving's not important. I get everywhere I want by pu public transport. It's much, much more environmentally sound. So we actually can get a stimulus and create emotions just by digging back into our memories. Now, another model, which I found very useful for splitting up how we experience things, was uh, or is the neurological levels model created by Robert Diltz. And he's split things up uh, into five categories. First of all, the environment. Now let's take the idea of the, uh, of the car again. When you get into a car, you're in an environment. And once in the car, you start to behave in a particular way. Checking the mirrors, putting the key in, putting the seat belt on, maybe adjusting the seat. And that's because you have capabilities and skills that enable you to do that. And those capabilities and skills have come from the belief that you have practiced driving before and that you value being a good driver. So your beliefs and values. And that builds up into uh, an identity. I'm quite a good driver. Now, if someone would say, who are you? I wouldn't say, oh, I'm a, I'm a good driver. But a Formula One sportsman might. Their identity is much more involved in what they believe about themselves with their capabilities and their skills and the way they behave in the environment of a racetrack. Now, this um, this doesn't obviously isn't just limited to cars. It could be learning to um, learning to ride a bike, learning to swim. The environment is the swimming pool or the sea. You behave in a particular way because you've got the skills and capabilities to swim. And you wouldn't get in there if you didn't believe you could swim because you value your life. And so, yeah, no, I'm not a bad swimmer. So we get our stimulus from the environment. And our response is all to do with our capabilities, our skills, our behaviours. So let's look into the way the, um, we access that memory matrix, which has been filtered. Now this information goes from our senses into our thalamus. It's like a switching section in the brain. And can heads off in two different directions. A lot of information, which is um, it's not particularly high quality, but there's a huge amount of it. This gets stored in the amygdala. Whereas we've got another part of our brain called the hippocampus, and that's where we store our very detailed memory. So for the amygdala, that's where we would store the feelings of um, uh, a significant emotional event. And the hippocampus, that's where we store information for our cognitive analysis. So let's have a look at the, uh, the amygdala section first of all. Now, the amygdala is part of the, uh, uh, the limbic system, the sort of lizard brain. And then as life evolved, we built layer upon layer upon layer onto the brain until we've got the human mammalian brain now. But the amygdala is connected directly, or is attached direct, directly to the, uh, the brain stem. So it can talk instantly to the uh, adrenal gland, which is sat on top of the kidneys. So it can fire information very, very quickly about whether there's a snake about and if you need to, um, if um, the body chemistry needs to change. And this is where we keep our emotions effectively, or has a profound effect on on our emotions. Um, we've got primary emotions; these are for our physical protection. 
if we get to see something that's frightening, we don't have to think about it, we just react instantly. We get a sort of emotional hijacking. So our protection emotions, they'll be fear, anger, pleasure and love. But we've also got process emotions, um, avoiding predators for instance. Now, if that goes, if that emotion gets too goes too far one way, we end up with phobias. Eating the right foods. Well, if that one gets a little unbalanced, we end up with some maybe some kind of dis eating disorder. Alliances and friendships, they are quite important to be fit into a community. Well, that can lead to low self-esteem, jealousy, and insecurity. Providing help to children and relatives, guilt, reading other people's minds. So that's important to know other people's intentions, if you can see from their face what they, um, how they might be feeling, but then that could lead to paranoia. And then we've got communication, which might lead to alienation and social phobias, and obviously selecting mates, well then we've got jealousy, insecurity and possessiveness. So these emotions that are really quite important to the way the human race has survived, if they go wrong, they can be quite uncomfortable. Then we've got... Um, the cognitive analysis bit. Now this is where we take all the information that we got from our senses and um, it goes, we send it off to all the little different bits of the brain. So the, the, we build the pictures in the, audit, in the um, visual cortex, the sounds in the auditory cortex, we, we understand language. The first emotions we experience are nominal processing or digital. It's good or it's bad, hungry, not hungry, crying, not crying. But as our brain begins to develop, we start to be able to order things. So we get ordinal processing as an evaluative emotion, starting to be able to put things in order, first, second, third. And then as a person gets more experienced, they begin to be able to put intervals in. And eventually, ratio processing, this is where you get the ability to think outside the box. First, second, third, well, great scheme of things, it doesn't matter. And it's through these thought processes that our ident identity actually springs. And that comes from our beliefs and values and our unique map of reality, which is going to be completely different to everybody else's. And that's where behavioral inevit inevitabilities arise. Oh, that person always do yeah, does that. Well, in this situation, they always behave in that way. And our map comes, as I said, from our ability to distort things. And something that's very useful is the difference threshold. This is the minimum amount of a stimulation needed for the nervous system to register the difference between two similar stimuli. Apparently my difference threshold is not set quite right from when my wife comes back from having her hair cut. The difference between her hair beforehand and afterwards is not sufficiently different for my system to register the difference. And that's because we got another thing called recurrent inhibition. This is the tendency to receive information from our senses primarily about change in our environment. So with the difference thresholds, we're looking out, imagine a, um, a caveman goes out of his cave, doesn't want to be th sitting there going, oh, the grass is just very, very slightly longer than it was yesterday, and miss the saber-toothed tiger. And by the same token, with um, the recurrent inhibition, if there's a rock out there, and it's always there, he doesn't want to get distracted by the fact that there's a rock there. He wants to be able to see the saber-toothed tiger. Something I also mentioned were the, uh, the fact that we have to delete a lot of information. We have to filter down about two million bits of information into between five and nine bits of information based on their survival value. Now, I say five and nine because a guy called George Miller, who was born in 1920, I think, in the late 50s, wrote a book called the magic number seven, plus or minus two. And if we go up a little bit to the, to the hippocampus, next to the, uh, the cognitive analysis, I've put down the seven plus or minus two. It's because we can only have between five and nine things in our short-term memory that we can really focus in on, or five and nine chunks of information. So we have to ignore a lot of stimulation so we can concentrate on the five and nine things that are most important to our survival. And then we've got the generalizations that I mentioned earlier. Trevor Sylvester in his book describes them quite well. We've got the, the cause and effect. And one of his examples, I think, is um, what do you believe causes the increasing rate of divorce? And the answer might be people meet too many people these days. Divorce is too easy. People don't go to church anymore. Men can't commit or all women are nags. 
So it's the way we build up our map of reality, saying this causes that. The other one is the complex equivalent. This is the same as that. Um, for instance, if someone was to get a divorce, they might make it mean something. It means that they were in some way inadequate, that they hate themselves, or that it's an opportunity to create a completely new life with new opportunities. And then, of course, the difference, which is just basically the same algorithm. So we use these mental algorithms to create our memories. So looking at this slide in its entirety, it's about senses and thinking. Now, one way of, I've heard this described is that there is some kind of life energy that none of us really understand properly, whether it be the universal mind or the Jedi's force be with you, or God, or life energy, or the fabric of space. The fact is, we are alive and we have a mind. We're conscious and we can think. So everything that's on this slide, we can sum up with those three principles of mind, consciousness, and thought. The thinking about them that creates an emotion. So the emotions come from our thinking, and our thinking comes from our previous experience. And we, so we create our reality by our thinking. And although, although everything around you obviously exists, your experience of the things around you are created within your own mind. And other people will experience those things slightly differently. They will distort them differently. They will delete different things. And they will generalize differently because they've had different experiences. Now this is where neuro-linguistic programming can really make a powerful difference. By modifying those thought processes, you can change the way you think and change the way you feel. If someone has got a phobia, invariably when they think about whatever it is they're frightened of, they think horrible images. Big, terrible images that are right in their face. So just by modifying that image, taking that big, terrible picture and pushing it off to one side, making it black and white, all blurry, putting a silly soundtrack on it, and all of a sudden, it's not so, not so frightening. In fact, it's kind of funny. That's how neurolinguistic programming can assist someone in feeling better when they used to have phobias.